Now, we wanted to, like I said, look at this Haley effect a little more and get a little better understanding of why social things are so much more important to teenagers than academic things. So we created um, one of the greatest things, there's so many great things about teenagers, one of my favorite things is that um, they believe they can be online anywhere at any time these days. Um, so we created a fake website and we told them we're going to put them in the MRI and we're going to ask them to um, answer some questions. Not emotional questions, just opinion. Just opinion questions, nothing tough, nothing terribly emotional. Um, and you know, it's kind of hard to <clears throat> work the keyboard while you're in the MRI. So the first time we run you through, you're not going to be logged into the website. It's just going to be a practice run. So it will look just like the website um, and function like the website, but you won't actually be online. Um, then once you've had this practice run, we're going to have you create a username and a password and you're going to be online um, with anybody else in the area who's your age who's also doing this survey. And when you answer, you will find out how many, uh, what percentage of your peers agreed with you. And then the website also randomly picks certain answers to post. So I do need to tell you that there's a chance that one of your answers, two of your answers might be seen by some of your peers. <laughs> Anyone who knows teenagers knows that's all it takes to convince them that they are constantly being watched because they're always being watched anyway. So once you make that mild suggestion, 100% of our participants believed they were online. 100% of our participants believed that at least one of their answers would be shown on the screen. They were never online. Nobody appeared on screen. Everything was pre-planned. It was all carefully controlled. Um, and when we asked them why, um, you know, did it bother them because they were using login names. They weren't even using their real names. They said to us, oh, everybody knows everybody's login. It's like you can figure out who it is. So the login didn't even make a difference. What were their brains doing? This is fascinating to me. So in that first run when they thought they were by themselves, um, and they're just answering questions all alone. This piece of brain is very active, and that's the frontal lobe. And they look just like adults in similar scenarios. There have been other studies done, and this, this, that same area of the brain is very active when adults are making choices and answering simple questions. The only thing that changed was their perception that they might be seen by their peers in some way. And look what happens. The amygdala goes bananas, and so does the insula. These are regions that cannot get up and going to lighting your hair on fire. Couldn't get these regions to go for that. But the idea that your peers might see you, bang, it turns on. So it tells you that if you have limited resources, those resources are going to be allocated to the things that are most important to you, as perceived by you. So this leads to a very, very important question. Um, why don't we talk about positive peer pressure? You hear a lot about peer pressure. And actually, peer pressure is something that has evolved to be very effective and to be uh, the easiest way to learn things. Those of you who are second or third children in your family know what I'm talking about. You learned so much from your older siblings, so many shortcuts and things. Um, you, you, know, you followed them around, you copied them. And those of us who are oldest remember how annoying that was, um, that you're always copying and always following us around. But you know what? It saves a lot of time. Um, younger children think older children are fascinating, and evolution made it that way so that they could learn from their mistakes. Same thing with the food poisons. It was that important because it would save time. Now, when we think about the positive side of peer pressure, I, I have to tell you, I've never had a parent come to me and say something like, you know, ever since um, Sarah joined the math team, she's just been uh, staying out all night and running around town and doing quadratic equations and <laughs> solving for unknown variables. And you don't hear that. You don't hear that. Because um, we, we kind of just do, have a collective like, oh, phew. Um, but guess what? If none of your friends do drugs, what are the odds of you doing drugs? Slim. Slim to none. If all of your friends are going to college, guess where you're going? To college. There is something so critically important about peer culture that we really don't understand yet. And nope, we're not part of it. We cannot be in it. But we can corral it in some way. And if you think about generations gone by where we used to have neighborhoods 
and you'd have, you know, old Mrs. Del Vecchio sitting on her porch, going, I'll tell your parents. Um, it kind of kept kids in line. It, cre it created a, a sort of a, a scenario, a maximum uh, danger zone, where if they went a little too far, they were going to get in trouble. But otherwise, they're left to their own devices. And those of you who remember being young and running around in your neighborhoods when we had them, um, you probably remember this, getting into a little bit of trouble, but always knowing that everyone in the neighborhood knew who you were, so you can't really get into major trouble. And that's what's so critical about the learning period of adolescence. Um.